You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. It is a dangerous world out there. Volatility is on the rise, and your clients' portfolios are under assault from a growing number of threats. Simple diversification is no longer enough to shield the assets under your protection. Registered investment advisors, financial planners, and asset managers need a new weapon in their war on risk. Welcome, Welcome to, to the, the Advisor's, advisor's option. option, the program designed to arm busy advisors with the information necessary to properly manage risk in this volatile environment. From options education, trading strategies and tips, to industry news and interviews, you'll find it all on the Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan defined risk mutual funds or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The advisor's option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop options strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end -end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning, options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. And now, it's time to learn how to implement options in your practice. It's time for the, the Advisor's, Advisor's Option. All right, everybody. That music means it's time once again for the Advisor's Option, the program here on the old network where we break down the sometimes scary, as we saw last week, sometimes just confusing or even impenetrable world of options for you, the busy financial advisor and asset manager. Maybe doesn't have time uh, to follow this portion of the market, particularly lately when your clients are ringing you off the hook about what the heck is going on out there. We're going to break all that down. What the heck is going on out there with craziness out there in the markets and volatility and the VIX and all that other good stuff? Don't worry. We've got you covered here on the Advisor's Option. My name is Mark Longo from theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, on the aforementioned network. You know how to get us. iTunes, the website, all those other good places, our app. And however you listen, whether it's live, after the fact, coming to you live today, by the way, here on the old Advisor's Option. A little fun surprise live stream for all you folks out there. Uh, make sure you hit us up, questions, comments, insights. I know you guys have a lot of them. You have been doing quite a bit of it <laughs> over the past week or two, as well as just this show in general. You guys love to hit us up, so maybe we'll have to have a whole Q&A show one of these days because you guys do like to send your questions. Keep them flowing. Uh, we read them all. We try to answer as many as we can on this show. If not, we'll filter them on to other shows or things like that, so don't worry. We won't leave you hanging, uh, but we do like to hear 
from you guys. And joining me on the old program today, I got my couple of my usual compatriots on the Advisors Option program. Starting out with a guy, feels like I just talked to him yesterday, probably because I did, <laughs> is Mr. Matt Ambertson, uh, the principal over there at ORATS, a.k.a. Options Research and Technology Services. Two things we have a lot of need of these days. Uh, Matt, welcome back to the Advisors Option. Thank you. Yes, it's, it's been very busy, but uh, good to be back, Mark. It's been a whole 24 hours, so hopefully you're not, you're not too tired of talking to me yet because we have a lot of talking to do over the course of the next hour. And joining us to help us do just that and make sense of this swirling maelstrom of a market we have around us these days is our old buddy Chris Hausman. He is the overlay specialist, shall we say, just, just the man about town over there, the go-to guy to do the overlays and everything else down there at Swan Global Investments. Chris, welcome back to the Advisors Option Program, sir. Mark, what's going on, man? Is that, your, is that your business card, go-to guy? The go-to guy? Uh, lately, I've been the vol guy. Someone put that on my title as well, so whatever works, right? Hey, these days, we all need a vol guy. <laughs> <laughs> we all want one of those in our corner. All right, with the team assembled, let's dive right on into the buzz. Busy financial advisors don't have time to follow the latest developments from the options market, so we do it for you. It's time to get the buzz. All right, everybody, welcome to The Buzz. This is, of course, the portion of the show where we break down the big noteworthy stories. Usually it's the breaking news, the trending developments, you know, coming out of the side of the space, maybe you don't have time to pay attention to. This this week, this episode, this month, <laughs> it's kind of all going to be mostly about one thing. Pretty much all the oxygen in the room has been sucked out by just the massive turbulence we saw in the markets last week. Of course, we are recording this and streaming it here right in the middle of the month, uh, February 15th. And does seem like it seems like forever ago now, but it was only only a little over a week ago now that we saw just the massive turbulence erupt in the marketplace, kicking off on Monday the fifth uh, with a uh, with a pronounced sell off in the marketplace that continued to be exacerbated in the after hours by just a dramatic movement in the VIX futures, which proceeded to just evaporate. Uh, two of the biggest trading products out there from the inverse volatility side of the space, of course, XIV and SVXY. Uh, we've since have been dealing with a lot of the fallout from that. VIX has been moving quite a bit. In fact, you just saw a piece coming out of Bloomberg, I think, uh, this morning, that yesterday, uh, the volatility of VIX, and there was a very interesting time frame where they used, I think, a 10-day realized vol of VIX uh, spiking, uh, the 10-day vol of VIX spiking over, uh, like, over, 500%, which is, I think it was 521%, which even eclipsed Bitcoin, which is at about 501%. Uh, so madness abounds out there. VVIX spiking over 200. Uh, things are now we're back in rally ho mode, apparently. So the VIX futures that were crazily backward are now looming towards Contango again. Uh, so who knows? Maybe all is right with the world. Maybe it was a blip. Maybe it was a harbinger of things to come. We'll get to that, uh, all of that. So let's start there. I think everyone's kind of thoughts. There's a lot of things that are probably top of mind for a lot of you guys and what just kind of what you're what you were going through when all this was happening maybe chris we'll start with you because you guys over there at swan this is this is kind of your business this is kind of your go-to time when all of it hits the fan that's when it's nice to be hedged so i'm curious a what were your what were your thoughts as all this was unfolding how did this impact you know your guys rolling and adjusting uh, the overlays over there and what were some insights there and then also see uh, what uh, were your clients, uh, what was going on with the clients over there? Were they panicking? Were they excited? What, what was going on? Well, you know, as you know, Mark, the defined risk strategy really has two components. And the, and the half of the piece that you're mentioning is the hedged equity portion. And that really is the bulk. You know, that is 85 to 90 percent of the portfolio. So, yeah, we are hedged during these events. Uh, we do welcome increases in volatility because we have all that back month vega with that long term put hedge, if you recall. So, you know, from that perspective, um, you know, things were well, and we were very comfortable with the, with that positioning. Uh, now, the other part of the defined risk strategy, a smaller piece, is the harvesting premium, right? Which is you know, writing options like a lot of other short volatility um, structures out there or funds. So, you know, when we have these type of corrections, when we have these five to ten percent corrections uh, as quick as you have, in, you know, within a three to five day span, those can be challenging. So. You know, this is when our risk management and 20 years of experience really comes into play, where we stick to our guns. We do what we know what we've been doing for so long. Uh, we've been through this environment before, and, you know, we execute and we make decisions based on how volatility is moving, et cetera, and try to navigate it through. The whole, you know, the whole program, the 
whole defined risk strategy is designed to win in bear markets, okay? It's gonna win in every bear markets, but it may not win in every small correction, right? That that five to 10% uh, nasty garden variety, I don't wanna call it garden variety, but you know, similar to the one that we just had. So, you know, August of 2015, if you recall the Chinese devaluation, that was a challenging period that we navigated through, but you know, we, we assessed, you know, the markets are always changing and evolving and we need to change and evolve with that. So we reassessed after, uh, August of 2015. And then after that, we went through, if you recall, the first quarter of 2016 was very volatile. Then we had Brexit. Then we had, uh, you know, there was a potential for a lot of volatility during the Trump election because futures did go lock limit overnight. But so so we've made some modifications uh, as we see the market changing with respect to volatility. And uh, we've been able to navigate this just fine, uh, you know, much, much better than August 2015. And so, you know, the, as a whole, the defined risk strategy has performed exactly as we have expected. So a lot of clients that have been with us um, over the years have been, you know, very satisfied. They've even gave us some praise on how we've been navigating the volatility the last uh, week or so. You know, some of the newer clients, um, they actually ask questions as they're learning the products and, and that's natural. And then we guide them through that and, and show them history and what we've done back in the past. And, and that, that this isn't something that we haven't seen before. And it's not something that, uh, you know, is going to be detrimental in the long run. Yeah, you know, a lot of people might not realize that because I think you guys, and they think of hedged, and you're right, you guys are designed to outperform in uh, a long-term bear market. But, of course, these near-term shocks are, are challenging because, right, you have that near-term portion of the overlay, and it's got to be challenging, I would imagine, for you guys as you're navigating this and trying to, you know, find ways to do those trades. So maybe without giving away the secret sauce, you know, walk us through a little bit of, of what you guys had to do over the course of the last week. Is it, was it a question of maybe just not putting on those legs, or were you were you widening things out a bit, or were you more picky? Because obviously liquidity, as we'll get to with Matt in a little bit, liquidity also a challenge in those markets as well. So what were some of the things you guys, you know, really had to do to, to keep the ball rolling over the course of that week? Yeah, so it's a combination of things. Um, it's a combination of being patient, uh, making sure the volat volatility is calming down, that the market is starting to find a, a foundation, if you will. So it's all of that. It's it's you know it starts with basic risk management, right? If a position is not working for you, then it's time to shut it down and take your losses and come back. I mean, this whole game is based on probabilities and you, or expected value. So you want to have that expected value on your side. So, you know, part of our risk management process is it's okay to take some losses here because we know that's still going to produce a positive expected value in conjunction with assessing, you know, where the marketplace is. So, you know, what do we do to defend? You know, we, we, A, we just shut positions down. That's part of it. Another thing is rolling positions down, you know, in the case of, of what happened recently um, or, or rolling them out in time. And, and it, not necessarily is the whole position as well. It's kind of, we have to make an assessment. We'd rather shut a position down and take a loss, a small loss, uh, as opposed to fight it and and double up or triple up or, or martingale it, if you will. So, because that's when, you know, that's when the disaster can, can happen. And we've seen that happen time and time again when you have these kind of events. And that's not what we're, we're not here to play for that kind of event. We're here for the long haul as our 20 year record uh, has shown. So yeah, it's a combination of a lot of things. It's a lot of work, but um, we always have a plan in place and, uh, you know, we just, you rely on your training also. I mean, I think that's where, you know, and, and Matt could probably attest to this during these kind of times as we've, you know, these are crazy times during the floor and we have, you know, ex floor traders managing the desk. So it's, it's good to know that, you know, we're able to, to survive and get through these types of periods where I think, you know, a lot of new traders nowadays, nowadays didn't get the kind of training that Matt and I got or, or and you Mark as well you know, having to, to, to go through that and, and feel the physicality, if you will, you know, today people, you know, we grew up with video games and we're hitting buttons. And I think you just don't feel the, um, you know, the reality sometimes when you're hiding behind a screen. I mean, that's just my opinion. So it's kind of like, it's okay to take a loss. And I think that's one of the things that, uh, you know, has kept us going for 20 years. It's a good term, physicality. I like that because you're right. When you were on the trading floor, it, there was a physicality to it. There was a physical nature. Some of these crazy days, they could almost hit you in the face with the uh, intensity of what was going on out there, which is something, you're right, that is kind of a little bit lost. It still certainly stings when you're losing, uh, losing money virtually or not or on the screen or if it's in person or not. There's certainly That certainly still leaves a mark, but there's something else to it, another degree to it when you're just surrounded by the cacophony of everyone kind of having all that happen to them at the same time across dozens, if not hundreds, of different pits and products. It's a, it's a different beast 
entirely. Matt, you know, same question for you. Obviously, this past week and a half or so has been a tumultuous one, historic by many different measures of the marketplace. You know, net VIX move. Pick, pick the product, pick the movement, and chances are it set a new record over the course of the past week. So I'm curious to you, what are, what are some of your key thoughts? What were some of your key takeaways? And then also, you know, third question to you as well, what were some of your clients and, and users hitting you guys up about? What were they asking about over the course of the last 10 days or so? Yeah, while well, Chris was talking, I, I was physically going back to the times on the floor uh, when things would just go berserk and you'd have people like leaning over you and yelling and wow, it was, it was some crazy times. And, and I do remember getting, getting trained by this old veteran. Uh, and he, I remember this quote, he said, don't panic unless you have to. And I was trying to figure out what that meant, but <laughs> I, I, but I think it relates to what, what Chris is talking about. And, you know, this is, you know, one of the challenges with the back test and, and, and also what I'm hearing from my clients. It's, okay, we've had this almost a regi regime change. Um, do we change what we're doing? And, um, you know, we've tested uh, and tested and tested with, with our clients. Um, we've actually tested in re regime changes, uh, and we do have some... Uh, clients that use different strategies for different regimes. So what we like to do and, and what we uh, hear appreciation from our clients is, listen, you're going to get these types of moves. And when you're in the middle of them, it feels like the world is is going to end, <laughs> especially on the floor. Or, you know, it's just we have to do something different. Well, you, you've, you, you know, you, th it's those times you got to go back to the numbers, see where you are, vis-a-vis -vis some historical perspective. Um, as I mentioned in some other shows, we even have data going back to the 1800s, you know, to try to look at some of the crashes because the, the psychology hasn't changed a lot. Obviously, a lot of th other things have changed, but uh, especially in these tail events, uh, you really have to get a perspective on, on what's happening, have tested it, have, you know, to be ready for them. Because, you know, it is difficult. Uh, one of the things that we've added to our backtesting uh, tool is what uh, what Chris is talking about, the, these kind of rolling out when, you, you know, we call it trade adjustments. You know, what, you know, what do we do if we get challenged on these shorts or if, you know, do we roll the other leg of the short? towards the other challenge. If you have a strangle and it's going down towards the put, do you roll the call down to get some extra premium? You know, there's a lot of ways that you could test that. But, you know, what we're, what we're finding is that, you know, it's get a good strategy, stay the course, you know, and don't panic unless you have to, Mark. <laughs> Wise words to live by from uh, that wizened old, uh, old fellow, that instructor veteran over there on the floor that's up there with when in doubt palms out and all the other good stuff turn those machines back on all the other good little sayings used to hear uh, all the time out there but a lot of things that are out there swirling in the ether people are debating and discussing you know i think we all learned like chris alluded to kind of learned an interesting lesson about the value of hedging you know over the past week week and a half or so and we talked on this show and other shows on this network in the past about the dangers of some of these other products and we'll get to those in a bit and the danger of just in general it seemed like the entire world had just fallen in love with blasting away at premium, whether it was in the VIX or whether it was out of the money puts in the S and P. It seemed like everyone was just love it. it. Just all the research, all the studies, all of a sudden saying, "Hey, look, selling pick your percentage out of the money puts that strategy works." And we all said, "Yeah, it does." Until it doesn't. And last week, last ten days was the time when it didn't. Uh, maybe Matt might have some, probably has some interesting data about that in a little bit. But you know, it, it does show, go to show at the end of the day things like being net short units. Uh, these strategies are just aggressively short downside. You know, these things seep in at a lot of places. And you know, we saw a big volatility fund last week that won awards recently, like the Pinnacle Award for Best Option Strategy in 2017, blowing out last week because clearly they didn't have the right protections and risk management in place. It is easy to fall in love with these strategies of just, you know, blasting away at puts or, or taking some of these other strategies, you know, getting along a ton of XIV because, hey, that, what can go wrong there? And, of course, uh, it, all, it all works until it doesn't. You know, Matt, I, I was thinking, you know, maybe this this time, because there are some people out there who maybe still are, maybe they haven't been broken of it yet, I don't know, who are still in love 
with the notion of just blasting out how the money puts. And it occurred to me, because we've often counseled, if you're going to do that, maybe, you know, put the, go the extra distance to make it into a put spread rather than a put. I understand it's going to cost you a little money in the near term, and it's, it's hard to, people want to harvest all that premium. It's hard for them to wrap their head around buying that lake. I'm curious, Matt, if you have any thoughts or perhaps even better, any data on something along those lines. If you're just blasting out straight puts versus, let's say, doing it in a more hedged spread type capacity, uh, you know, how does that fare? You know, particularly for an, a, a week like last week where, you know, a massive event could come along and pretty much wipe you off the board if you're not careful, right? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a tough call, really. Um, you know, we back test put spreads. We back test naked puts. You know, selling put spreads, and you know the naked puts look better. Well, um, as you said, they look better until they don't. Um, and this this was the uh, refrain from the Credit Suisse CEO, Mr. Theum, um, on the XIV. You know, it worked well. It worked for a long time, I think he said, until it didn't. And you know, this market uh, last week went down, and then it came back. You know, if it kept going down, you know, those short puts are blowout risk. And so, you know, when I was on the floor and I backed traders, you know, I was one of the, the, the small groups there with small funding. And so my traders were, you know, somewhat handicapped. When you say when in doubt, palms out, that means sell. Um, my refrain was when in doubt, palms in. <laughs> it doesn't really rhyme. But, um, you know, we had to be at least net flat units um, and hopefully net long units, we could be net short premium. And that's what a put spread does. So, yeah, I mean, th so the testing it shows that the, the put spreads don't perform as well, but one of the, one of the ratios that I like to, to uh, present, and I think I've talked about it here is a debacle ratio not just the sharp ratios or Sortino ratios or what have you, but a ratio that considers what could have gone wrong, not just what did go wrong. Um, and when you say, when you consider what could have gone wrong, I mean, you have to have some historical perspective, I mean, but still look way back and see what could happen. And, you know, that's your debacle down way down there. So when you're looking at your returns, one of the ratios that you should consider is this debacle ratio. You know, like for example, you know, the market could have kept going. It could have gone down, you know, 25, 35%. Who knows? How would your positions have looked down there? That would be uh, a, a debacle ratio, meaning, you know, then you could start to compare the, you know, average returns from a short put to the average returns of a put spread. Clearly the, the debacle divisor is much smaller um, in the put spread. You can't lose as much so uh, in the put spread. So th that's one way to think about it. Even though these all these tests, and you, you alluded to them, Mark, are showing, yeah, the, these, these out of the money puts are a winner. Um, you know, they are until they are not. And I think we saw that in the XIV. It was a great trade until it didn't. And you see that, un unfortunately, in some of these other funds that really levered up and, and sold some volatility, Mark. Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, and those moments when they, when they aren't winners could, you know, really wipe out many, many years. You know, if you're out there harvesting 15, 25, 30 cents a pop, and then you lose many dollars. Uh, that's that's going to add up to quite a lot of time and money, if not blowing out completely. So yeah, I'm with you. Maybe maybe that should be something you guys have. You guys thought about slapping a TM on that and putting that out there? The ORATS debacle ratio, Matt. I think you might have something there. I, I, well, I wanted to float it here and get your blessings on it first, Mark. Oh, well, there you go. I, I bless it. I don't. I don't you have to send me the exact equations so I could break it down. But of course, uh, I, the name sounds good. I like the name. As and I think certainly. Because there's a, we know that we know there's a large mass of advisors and asset managers out there who are obsessed with things like Sharp and Sortino. I think the debacle ratio, I think, could those names, 
they just don't have any cachet to them. Uh, when you say to a client, your debacle ratio is a 0.75, their eyes are going to pop open. They don't know what that means, but it's going to get their attention. So I think you might be onto something there. I don't know, Chris. What are your thoughts on uh, on all things debacle ratio and all the other topics we're hitting on here? Well, first, I, I bless it. I like it. Um, and kind of going on that note, um, you know, last year's theme was that volatility is in the toilet and that hedging costs just kept getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. So one of the things that we did do uh, in our analysis of volatility and expected value and all that kind of stuff was we actually purchased some extra hedges uh, along the term structure. So that was one of the things that buffered us really well, you know, added some convexity, uh, you know, and that's exactly this, the difference between just the, uh, an outright short put and that put spread. At least that put spread is, is giving you some protection. It's defining your risk and it is adding some convexity, if you will, against the short put, not all by itself because it's being counteracted. But And that was one of the things that we did in some of our strategies, a little bit different than what we've done in the past here, was really, you know, go out and kind of figure out what is the best hedge um, you know, can we add more of a hedge to our, our hedged equity portion, if you will, but also kind of um, define some of the risk a little bit better but via put spreads, uh, kind of what Matt has been showing here. A little bit of convexity goes a long way. Did your mentor also tell you that on the floor? Matt, well, he should have. That's a good one to go along with the debacle ratio. You know, the other thing everyone has on their, on their brains these days, can't get enough of uh, this endless debate it is, of course, as we alluded to earlier, the, the whole inverse vol space that kind of exploded over the past few years. It's been around for a while, but it really hit its stride over the past couple of years. seems like everyone and their mother was getting into this space, even places that don't really talk about derivatives like the New York Times had sweeping profiles of a target trader who had, you know, made millions of dollars trading XIV effectively and shorting the VIX. And then, you know, the, the logic goes, if a target manager or target guy can do it, so can you. And so we had everyone and their grandmother piling into these trades, uh, even though people like us have been warning for a long time that, hey, you know, there's caveats in these things. These things are dangerous. And if you read the prospectus, this thing can go to zero if you're not careful. And that's unfortunately exactly what happened, at least with XIV, uh, which has a termination date, I believe, coming up in a few days, a little bit less than a week. It's going the way of the dodo. Uh, SVXY, though, survived and continues to trade, which kind of raises the specter. A lot of people are out there kind of on both sides of the fence. We see people out there, uh, people in the industry, commissioners and others saying, these things never should have been approved. They should never have seen the light of day. Why do they exist? They should have massive red warning flags on them. Retail should never touch them with a 10-foot pole. Others who are saying, yeah, you know, maybe they, they took a lot of people out, but on the flip side, they kind of did what they said they were going to do, and they kind of they they disclaimed all this. Maybe they buried it in the in the prospectus, a hundred pages in, but they did disclaim this. And these products kind of did what they advertised. You just didn't understand the advertisement. Uh, I'm curious. Maybe Matt, we'll start with you. Which side of this uh, this debate do you fall on? Well, um, you know, we've talked about this before. Uh, the, I don't trade these types of instruments. I mean, if if I don't understand them. You know, backwards and forwards. I'm not going to trade them, and I, I, I read the perspectives, and you know, when I start getting into it, and and there's really so many different things that they could choose to do or not choose to do. Um, you know, Credit Suisse, for example, not only was the the fund manager of the XIV. But they were the biggest investor in the XIV, so they had that's, a double that's, whammy. That's kind of the shady part of it, right there. You're right. They yeah. they didn't disclose that they also owned about a third of it. <laughs> and I mean, they were the. I, I just glanced at, it, but they were the biggest. Looks like by double, you know. And so when they had to come and cover, and you know, they cover after the close when the liquidity is the lowest, it, you know, and they, and then they make it even worse for themselves, you, you know. So, so basically, what happened is. Is they're the 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 fund manager, so they they are responsible for losses greater than zero. I mean, investors can't lose more than their investment, but the Credit Suisse can. So that what they do is they put a buffer in, and they called it twenty percent. And when it gets to that point, they could say no moss and effectively close the fund down, liquidate all their holdings and you know it's probably going to cost another 10 to 20 percent to liquidate everything and so i mean that's a tough tough you know talk about negative convexity it's uh, the thing that really worries me about all these trades out there is the feedback loop the feedback loop is what um you know investors and frankly i don't really or you can't really put a number on when you start selling and that causes the need for more selling 
um, you know, they're trying to flatten out, but as they're trying to flatten out, they're getting shorter and shorter. So that's that's my my feeling is that, firstly, uh, um, you know, it has to be. I mean, I'm a caveat emptor. I'm a, you know free market guy, but you know you really have to disclose what these these folks are doing, and including you know what could could happen and 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 back test things out. I mean, we're, when when. When uh, firms are using these option strategies, they often come to us to back test it and stress test these things. Well, this, the same thing should be set, uh, should be done with these funds. And again, re, you know, warning signs on them. And you know, I mean, a lot of these people are are getting their information from blogs or you know Twitter or whatever. And you know, the, the and then all of a sudden they're just gone. They, you know, and and it's like. I can't remember who told me to do this trade, you know, and so, um, you know, they're, they're getting into things that they don't under, understand and that's a fool and it's money type thing. And it's, it's sad to see. Um, but, you know, and also there's, there's some things that are, uh, you know, not real responsible that these fund managers have done as well, Mark. Yeah, you know, it is an interesting state of affairs. I'm curious, Chris, what are you, what are your thoughts on this uh, evolving uh, inverse VIX debate. You think these products never should have been approved? Do you think they kind of did what they advertised, even though maybe the advertising wasn't uh, wasn't uh, as much as it could have been, or you know, or maybe you fall somewhere else? Well, I mean, this is a classic uh, the snake eating itself, if, if you can visualize that. Um, uh, you know, this, these products were developed uh, for institutions. And they were developed as an overlay to an institutional book on a very small portion of that book. Uh, and as you mentioned, they've had a lot of success over the last years. So my theory really here is, you know, once the media gets a hold of a successful strategy, they just made it mainstream. And once you've turned it out to the masses and the blogs get a hold of it and people start thinking, well, if it's good enough for an institution, it's good enough for me. That's when, and then they, they get FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Well, all those in quotes, smart guys are making all this money hand over fist. I want some of that as well. And I think that's dangerous and that lures people without reading the prospectus, without understanding uh, the mechanics of, of what could or what could not happen with a certain product. Like people could, people literally confusing XIV for a company, thinking that it was an actual company or it was actual, an actual stock or an ETF. I mean, it starts with that. So, uh, you know, to answer the question, should they have been invented? Look, you know, people are always going to invent new products. I mean, you can't stop it. As long as as as, as Washington changes laws, uh, as SEC changes regulations, somebody is in a in a in a laboratory with lawyers and engineers and ex traders and managers trying to develop the next best product. Okay, um, so. Yeah, maybe they should have done a better job. Hey, this is, or maybe maybe brokerages should have done a better job of asking the clients, um, "Are you an institutional client? Do you qualify? Do you really understand or have a pop up right before you buy XIV or whatever related product? You know, do you really understand what you're getting into?" Um, I don't know if they had that or didn't have that. Um, I know after the event that some of the brokerages stopped letting people, you know, buy these on margin. So. Um, they can be dangerous, but they are in the prospectus. People need to understand the nuance of their product. Uh, it's an unfortunate event, especially how quickly it happened because it didn't really allow. If you look at the close, I believe XIV closed at $99 that day, and all this happened after hours like, like Matt did. So you know, if you're just looking at your print or close to the close and you're like, oh, I'm fine, and you walked away and, and you had a big surprise the very next morning. So um, – Again, I people just need to do a better job of understanding what products they're in. Um, if if you are retail and you want to play with this kind of stuff, my recommendation is don't go on margin. Uh, make sure it's all it's play money and that it's not going to change your lifestyle if you lose ninety percent and your kids are still going to go to college. Yeah, if you're touching SVXY now, it should definitely be in the quote unquote discretionary account. And maybe you don't touch the underlying. Maybe you play in the uh, in the options instead, because uh, we've seen there is massive uh, go to zero risk with these things, not just from the futures, but from the the counterparties and others deciding, hey, we want to we do we, we need to get the heck out of dodge on this thing. And we haven't yet to see the regulatory shoe drop on this stuff, which we know is coming. Uh, after this debacle, there will be hearings and everything else. So that could also is also an unintended risk lurking out there with some of these other products that may get regulated to death 
as a result. But I'm kind of with you, Chris, on this, that, you know, they probably, you know, these things disclaim what they were going to do, so, you know, that's, but that sense also probably was incumbent on some of the brokers. And it's hard, because they get paid and people trade, so they want people to trade. But on the flip side, so it's hard for them to put roadblocks in front of people. But in other cases, see these products out there, you know, you see your list of quote-unquote ETF and ETP products, which most people don't even understand the difference there. They think all things are just ETFs. Uh, they see, you know, they'll see SPY up there, they'll see GLD, some of the other ones that they know. And right next to it, they'll see things like XIV kind of listed in the, in the thing. I say, oh, it's, you know, it's an ETF. It's a stock. You know, I could just buy it, and uh, it's up there with some of these other ones that are much more trusted and vetted and have survived a lot of these environments versus these kind of Franken products like XIV that were kind of just constructed out of whole cloth uh, and haven't really had the shocks to the system that these other products have endured. So they're kind of given the bona fides of the other products next to them on the page when in reality this thing probably should have many pages of click-throughs to get to before mom and pop or whoever can trade this thing. So yeah, there's a lot of challenges here, and I, I do think, I think we've seen the end of this debate. Whenever things get wiped out, we tend to have a lot of hearings and a lot of anger as a result. So it probably hasn't gone away just yet. Speaking of anger and hearings and all sorts of other things, the other big thing coming out of last week's debacle uh, was just this continuing drumbeat. We talked about on the show before about usually discussion around VIX and the issues with it come around settlement. We talked about it recently on the show. I encourage you listeners, if you missed that episode, go back in our archives just a few episodes back and find the episode where we talk about volatility and VIX. We get into some of the issues around the settlement and how people can do things like they call carpet bombing to put these bids in these puts that are otherwise usually worthless and that some people contend could help to adjust with the settlement of the VIXs. And we've seen this debate going on for a while. It seems like now there's a new wrinkle to this where there's this quote-unquote whistleblower uh, who's put uh, this report into the CFTC and the SEC alleging that manipulation was also at the heart of what happened last week, which was, of course, that historic run-up, particularly towards the end of the day in the VIX on Monday and, of course, even more so in the after hours there with the futures, which is something I, I've never really seen, you know, alleged before that we've seen people talk about the carpet bombing around the settlement. I've never seen someone saying this is happening without trading in real time in the, in the markets. And of course, it could also extend into the futures in the after hour. That, that, again, I haven't read the complaint. I've only seen uh, what's kind of been reported on it through the media. I haven't had a chance to read it myself. So that's kind of like playing a game of telephone. Uh, you want to read it yourself to really understand. But I, this sounds a little... I don't know, a little, a little, maybe a bridge too far to me. I'm curious, maybe, Matt, what you think on this. Uh, do you think this has some legs, or do you think this is kind of a lot of what we've seen before just kind of applied in a new way? You know, we're sitting so far away, Mark, that, uh, you know, obviously take my comments with a grain of salt. But, you know, as we, the three of us are past market makers, we've, we've seen some pretty uh, questionable activity down there on the floor, at least I have. You know, so many times you'd be uh, trading a stock and then all of a sudden it wouldn't trade for a year and then someone would come in and buy a ton of puts and, you know, it would go down. So they knew exactly what's going on. Now, I I, I don't know uh, what's going on with the VIX, but it's, you know, and I read the prospectus and, and my eyes were watering over, like I can't even, or glazing over, I should say. And, you know, it's... It, I, it's confusing the way it's it, – it, it seems like there could have been a more straightforward way to make the VIX. Um, it, you know, any option with a bid. Now, granted, uh, those out-of-the-money carpet-bombed um, calls and puts, really, um, are – uh, are weighted less, and so it's very difficult to you know manipulate. But you know if you do enough of it um, in conjunction with you know some other types of trades that are alleged by this whistleblower, and and just going through my mind while I was reading it, you know I'm I'm leery of the VIX. Um, you know I've I've often wondered um, what would happen if the VIX uh, were to uh, uh, have an expiration and the market, some type of a big market event would close the VIX down. I think in that case, what I've heard from the SIBO is that the OCC would then come in and try to estimate a close. You know, so I mean, there's just a lot of things uh, that are are in the VIX that are, to me, uh, questionable. And in this case, the manipulation, I mean, there's there's a lot of smoke. Um, is there fire? I don't know. But it's, it, you know, now with the, the whistleblowers coming, it was funny. Uh, I was at a conference out in Dana Point last week, and, and one of the booths was the whistleblower booth. And I've never seen that before. And, and um, 
the lady there said that she had a, a lot of good feedback. So I think you're going to be seeing um, more whistleblowers uh, in the coming uh, months and years, Mark. Matt, Matt, you can come clean to us. It's just us, just you and us on the show, nobody else listening. You can come clean to us. You are the whistleblower, correct? Uh, no, are you sure no one's listening, Mark? Yeah, just, just us. Just you, me, and Chris. Just chatting, chatting with a couple of guys about all things volatility and VIX. I have seen that booth before. They are trying to incentivize more people to get out there. And if this guy has data, I mean, I know FINRA is going to investigate it now, which I'm looking forward to, to actually actually have some data, you know, outside of SIBO and others. Because they even admit, they don't, they, you know, people are going to look at them and say, hey, you, you own this product. You have a vested interest. Uh, so it's good to have someone like FINRA come in and, and look at this. But I, I've never really, I, I'm still interested to see how they could somehow tie what he's alleging to the actual movement, particularly when it's these, like you mentioned, these kind of worthless puts that are heavily, you know, heavily underweighted in the calculation. It would take a lot to really do any sort of movement, let alone what happened in the after hours, which was the lion's share of the problem, which, of course, wiped out XIV. That, of course, was Credit Suisse's doing. We know that. So so it's an interesting kind of where what this guy is really alleging at the end of the day. Uh, Chris, I'm curious your thoughts on this one as well, the whole kind of just uh, ongoing VIX uh, kerfuffle, sir. Yeah, I guess <clears throat> I will, excuse me, I'll answer that from a, a option pricing model perspective, okay? Uh, kind of like what Matt said, you know, the VIX doesn't include zero bids in its calculation. And once it runs into consecutive zero bids, it basically cuts off the tail. It won't include any more strikes on both the uh, out of the money put and call side. So, you know, if, if you do put a nickel bid in for those options, you know, th and, and these options are expiring, uh, in a couple of days, because the VIX expiration is on a Wednesday, versus uh, you know, you know these options that are way out of the money and getting closer and closer to expiration, the model is going to kick back this very very high volatility. So again, I, I don't know what the weighting is of those baby options, um, and I don't know how many pseudo false bids you would have to put in there to make some type of dent. I don't have any evidence to say that there's manipulation. Could it happen? Um, sure, it could happen. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, Matt said he saw a lot of different things on the floor. And, and so, but, you know, the SIBO definitely contends that it's not happening. And since I don't have any hardcore evidence to say otherwise, I have to side with the SIBO that, you know, the VIX is still working the way it should be. You know, the VIX, it, it was a good product. It is a good product to measure what? Supply and demand. And I'm always telling that people that it's, it's the underlying movement, the speed of that movement, the direction of that movement, and the magnitude of that movement that creates supply and demand, which the VIX then measures, right, through a nice, easy calculation. And I've always said it's the dog wagging the, call, the, the tail, rather, right? Um, unfortunately, what just happened last week was the other way around, right? The tail, right, wagged the dog. And so it's, it's unfortunate that a good calculation like the VIX, which purely measured supply and demand, um, can or could be manipulated, or you've got all these other type of volatility products out there that are having uh, an effect on it, like it, it didn't have, uh, you know, back in the past. Yeah, that's always been the question about VIX for a while now, as the VIX universe of ETPs has grown. These are all trading products with their own lives. Uh, and could they potentially feed back in and effectively, like you said, wag the dog? And that's always speculation that I've seen are some of these ETPs out there. Are they the ones going to then come in and somehow influence the VIX somehow, maybe end of day stuff? Uh, but we haven't seen that the VIX now somehow also moving the S&P, which seems to be what's being alleged in this uh, in this latest whistleblower. Matt, I'm sure you have more thoughts on this. Have at it, sir. The one of the measurements that I look at is this kind of curvature or derivative. So you got your 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 slope of, of uh, a monthly expiration, and then you got how much the calls and puts on the wings are coming off of that kind of tangent line. Often it's um, you know often in the uh, in the uh, SPX, it's very straight. But what we've been seeing lately is that curvature coming off of it. And that's suspect to me. I mean, that those are the small puts. And it doesn't have to be just the the no bids becoming a bid, but it, it, but just the smaller ones are starting to creep up. And, and that, you know, that kind of sets something off in, in my mind. And also, you mentioned it earlier in the show that the just the, the volatility of the VIX um, you know, was 600. We have a we have a slightly different measure at at, at ORS. I mean, that's close to close measurement, but we we measure inter, interday. I mean, we have it at 500, um, and the the 10 day vol, the high over the last five years before that was roughly half. So volatility is just uh, in the VIX is is skyrocketing now. Is that because of 
of what? You know, one of the things is I think the VIX is getting so large in Vega compared to just the market itself. I think again, uh, as as Chris said, the the uh, the snake eating its tail and in the feedback loop, uh, you know, sh certainly seems to have something to do with that extra volatility. But the fact remains that there's more derivative um, cur curvature there. Um, there's more volatility in the VIX. Um, I agree that the you know the the CBOs you know has some rules and that says you have to have uh, you bids in the market for at least ten minutes. But you know uh, uh, like these these guys are pretty creative is is all I could say. So um, you know I'm I lean towards you know as a market maker I'm you know you have to be a kind of a conspiracy theorist to survive down there and I and I think that's and I still have a little bit of that but you know it sure seems like there's a lot of smoke around the VIX mark. Yeah, you know it's interesting. I I always held to the assumption that these guys if they're willing to commit capital to do it, at least they're taking some sort of risk for it. I mean, clearly people were spending money on these quote-unquote carpet bombing puts more so years ago. It seemed like it kind of went away. Now it seems like it's back on the radar again. But now if they're finding ways to do it, like like the whistle, quote-unquote whistleblower ledges without even trading, that's an extra wrinkle, which is is interesting. I wouldn't mind seeing how that's uh, how that's broken down. Again, we got to wait for the data to come out. But it's an interesting debate that we certainly – haven't heard the last. I'll probably get into it again in a little over an hour on the option block. So, so stay tuned for that. More thoughts on that. But before we keep rolling, get some of our listeners on the show here, Matt. Uh, I know you guys over there at ORATS have been busy uh, cranking away a lot of great research. You guys obviously have a lot of great data over there and really putting together some interesting stuff about uh, slippage as well as what's kind of comparing and contrasting what we saw over the last week and 10 days to some other recent events like the flash crash. So why don't you go ahead and, and illuminate some of our listeners out there who, particularly on this show, love to get their data uh, on what you found out there over the last couple of weeks on, on your blog there. Yeah, so we we do have, have, have quite a bit of data. We save uh, snapshots of the market every couple of minutes, and, and I get to go back and, and look at that you know, on these days like the 5th of February. And one of the things I was looking for was you know, how did the markets react? Because one of the things that uh, we talked about last OIC out in Phoenix, uh, Mark, was, you know, the the exchanges were getting together and, and trying to, you know, support the market makers as they try to get more liquidity into these markets. Well, you know, I wanted to see how the liquidity fared during uh, Monday and, you know, the rest of the week, frankly. And, and it did not fare very well. So just to, to give you a couple uh, data points, you know, we look at the bid ask width, um, and usually it's about eight to 10 percent of the uh, option price is how wide the you know, someone's willing to pay and someone's willing to offer the bid ask. What happened during the Monday, that went from eight to 17 percent over over double. Uh, so they, they widened out the market quite dramatically. And then another thing that we look at is the size, the average size on the bid and, and offer. And that has fallen in the last few years from, you know, the mid 300s and 400 to down to only 138 on the, the week before the what I call the short vol crash. And so it went from 138 down to 100. You know, and that's you know that's precipitous. I mean, that's pretty. You know that. So there's no size or very very little size, and very wide markets. And so I calculated that it cost option traders over a billion dollars in additional slippage as to what would have happened the week before. So all this XIV and and, and VIX, you know, was a, extremely expensive to to just people out there trading options. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, so you, you, you might say, well, yeah, I mean, the markets are going to widen out and, you know, the size is going to go down. Uh, that's pretty typical of, of a event-driven day. Well, I went back and, and found I had to go back um, all the way to August 24th of 2015 to find a day that's that's similar. Uh, the flash crash where uh, on the flash crash, the, the SPY was down 4.1%. It was down 42 on Monday. Uh, the one-day volatility uh, was 55. It was 60 um, on Monday. Uh, so very similar days. By the way, it's difficult to calculate a one-day volatility. ORATS has a, uh, a way to do that where we simulate hedging and turn it into a volatility. You can't really do it with close to close. But um, 
so you know and then we compared you know what happened to market widths on the the flash crash well whereas on monday was up a hundred percent it was only up 48 percent uh on the flash crash and the size went down uh 18 percent on the flash crash but it was down you know nearly 30 percent uh in the uh, what i call the short vol crash so um, this is a fragile market now. It's much more fragile than it was even um, in 2015. And I think a lot of this is because the market makers have, uh, this, the, the numbers of market makers have dwindled. And, um, you know, it's just tougher to add liquidity out there. Um, and, and it's difficult. It's expensive to get the technology. It's expensive to buy the data. Um, and you, of course, you buy a lot of the data from the exchanges, and a lot of the, the exchanges are, are charging more in fees. And you know, so I, the, there has to be an effort, in my opinion, by the exchanges to support the market-making uh, faction of, of, for options. You need to have a strong market-making group. There are almost a million options out there. You can't let that go just out to the market. That there needs to be a strong market-making force. It started with market makers in the SIBO. It, it, you need the market makers out there to make fair and accurate markets, Mark. Yeah, you know, that's something I brought up with uh, the exchanges quite a bit. We've seen more market making firms leaving than entering the space, unfortunately, in recent years. And this is yet another example of that. Ironically, I was chatting with some retail traders yesterday or two days ago, and they were lamenting to me they want to get into options. They're stock traders, but they trade some more esoteric names outside of the top 20 you usually hear about in the options world. And when they try to get options on those, uh, the spreads are just too overwhelming for their strategies. They just can't do it. Uh, and uh, that's, a, that's a complaint I've heard a lot. And now we have this data coming in, you know, from, from Matt, from your team there, that shows even on some of the big names <laughs> over the course of, of the past week, when things start getting crazy, that, that liquidity gets a little bit more elusive as well, which is, you're right, is a challenge. And I don't know how we fix that short of finding some way to incentivize market makers to come back to the space. And I get to see a uh, really coherent plan to do that outside of maybe delisting a lot of these strikes that don't really trade, you know, the 200 to handle out of the money strikes and some of these names that are just added risk to the books of these market making firms. If you turn off a lot of those, then maybe they could take some risk off their books and not just turn them off, maybe turn them RFQ so they could trade if you want to. But outside of that, they're not listing them all the time and quoting them all the time, which we all know is risk then, of course, maybe that could incentivize them to get a little bit more active, get a little, and have more of them maybe come back to the fray. We'll see. But uh, that's only – there are other proposals out there, but I haven't really seen anything concrete hitting the ground yet, which would affect this. Chris, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on this. Uh, this obviously impacts you. You're a guy out there trying to get that liquidity on weeks like, you know, the last week and a half, last 10 days or so. I'm sure you've experienced this anecdotally, uh, but what are your thoughts on actually hearing the data and seeing how little actual liquidity there is for you out there to get in times like that? Yeah, so, I mean, I, I would assume that this is uh, liquidity analysis on single stock names, and correct me if I'm wrong, but th there has been a general trend that liquidity has been drying up on on the stock names, and just like you mentioned, you know, if you go past the top 20, uh, it really drops off precipitously. So, you know, we, you know, we trade some of the most liquid products here at Swan. So, uh, you know, the S and P 500, uh, spiders, you know, on the ETF side, uh, and some of the largest ETFs like you know EEM emerging markets. So we, yeah, I mean, during times of of high volatility. Bid ask spreads are going to increase. That's natural, but again, I, I don't think you know we have not experienced the liquidity draft that if you know, like Matt is mentioning here, that is specific to single stock names. So um, yeah, it gets a little bit more challenging during times of, of stress or high volatility. But the good thing is a lot of this liquidity that has been leaving the single stock names has been going towards uh, the index products. And you can see, you know, the S SPX is still setting highs with notional volume uh, and contracts traded. So that's the good thing. So yeah, it's, it's, it's hurting one side of the options market, but I think it's also going towards another side of the options market. Yeah. Um, by the way, that my analysis was on every single option traded. So it included um, the the very liquid names, but um, but you're right. I mean, um, the uh, you know the number of of liquid names is small in comparison to the number of options in the 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 illiquid names. 
but I also looked at just volume traded, and when I calculated that my billion dollars was uh, was uh, you know it was volume adjusted, so you know it weighted those uh, a little bit higher. But yeah, Mark, back to your proposal. Um, you know, I I just think that you need to have incentivize more market makers to come in. I think people would love to quote those those wider markets. Um, but it just doesn't make sense, and there's no liquidity there. And it's again, that's the tail wagging the dog. The tighter markets are going to get liquidity, and the the wider markets are are not getting the liquidity, and 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 they're forcing the the very few market makers not to to concentrate or post liquidity out there. So it's again, it's feeding on itself. Um, there needs to be uh, an active campaign to get more market makers into this. Uh, into this industry, it's an unhealthy trend that needs to be stemmed, Mark. Yeah, I think as your our old buddy and your buddy as well, Alan Grigoletto pointed out in your in your blog, there uh, five big market making firms and fifteen venues to trade on is is not a healthy ratio, and that's part of the problem as well. The number of trading venues, aka exchanges, continues to expand, uh, and yet we have seen not not any really new additions. Uh, to the options market making space in that time. So if you're coming into the space now, you have to stream quotes to 15 different venues now, and the risks associated with that are are enormous, let alone the costs. And so you know, I know people who are market makers for a long time. When I asked them if they would get back in, pretty well known ones, they've all said no. You know, if they, they cite a lot of reasons, the risks, of course, are out there, but also the startup costs are enormous. Uh, to get a, a real legit size market making operation up and running and having the quotes and the capital, uh, you know, the estimates are anywhere probably around twenty million dollars to have a legit operation up and running, and uh, that's just a lot of people don't want to commit that to a marketplace that has a lot of issues uh, that where a lot of the quote unquote edge has been regulated away, and you're left trading the same handful of products as everybody else in the top twenty, and if you get outside of that, it's just too wide and you get run over, so you make things too wide. So yeah, it's a, it's an interesting challenge, and I know people people in the industry understand this and they're, they're working to. Re- resolve it. Unfortunately, I've yet to see uh, the proposal that can do that. And certainly we haven't seen it in the space where market makers continue, unfortunately, to flee in weeks like last week. Uh, oftentimes don't help because they could shake out a lot of the firms that maybe were interested or were playing and just didn't have the risk capital to, to, uh, to stay in the deep end of the pool in, in times like that. Speaking of time, we're pretty much out of ours, unfortunately, uh, listeners. There's that music. Yeah, you know, we try to get your questions. This was we had so much to talk about this show, listeners, that there wasn't uh, wasn't enough time <laughs> to get. Uh, we'll get to more on the next episode, I promise. And if you're listening live and you have questions, uh, stay tuned. In about an hour, we'll be back with the option block. You can get your questions, and I guarantee you we'll be diving more into these debates here, at least particularly on the VIX side, and perhaps some other fun things as well. So stay tuned for that. And if you're listening to the advisors option on the podcast, hey, we like you guys too. And, of course, uh, keep those questions coming. We'll answer them as many as we can. Uh, great stuff over there as well from the data and everything else that we're learning about here. And we'll keep an eye on it here for you guys out there in the Advisors Options audience. But before we go, as always, let me go back around the horn. Let me start with Chris. Chris, now that you guys are, are digging out from uh, the madness of the past week and a half, uh, what, what's cooking over there in the land of Swan? Any interesting articles on the site? Any interesting educational events? What's coming up from you guys? Yeah, well, we've uh, been busy on the blog post trying to explain what's going on to everybody. So um, we just finished off a SIBO RIA forum in Dallas last week, which I attended. So that was a good opportunity. We met a lot of advisors, talked to them about how they can incorporate options into their positions. Uh, and also we continue with the 10th box seminars, uh, you know, which, as you know, is a series of regional due diligence meetings. So that's a good opportunity for advisors, investors to meet the portfolio managers, you know, and discuss whatever challenges they may have in today's marketplace. And we are getting ready for our CIO conference. That's going to be in Chicago again this year. And we're slated for May 14th and 15th. There you go. If you're active in the space, maybe you want to become active or you just want to check out what they're up to. Uh, hit, hit the Swan CIO Summit or head on over to their website. A lot of good content over there. Even when, uh, even in between show times, <laughs> Swan Global Investments is that site. They have the blog, they have the newsletter, they call the good, the bad, and the ugly. Always some good research coming out of uh, Mark and Mika and the rest of the team uh, over there. So stay tuned for that. Speaking of good research, we just talked about some of it. Matt, you guys are on fire over there at Orats with your blog and all your data. Uh, what can we expect from you guys in the coming months, sir? 
Yeah, we have uh, many more blog posts to come. We've updated our database through last week, and we're running a lot of the uh, back tests through it, and we've gotten a lot of questions from our clients, and and so that's been a, a lot of fun to you know update this database so quickly, and run through the uh, the tests and see how. Um, you know, many of these funds uh, would have performed, you know, before they're, uh, you know, I think it's going to be a little bit ugly uh, when they start to, to present their quarterly results or monthly results or something. But we're able to, you know, do quite a bit of backtesting and, and we're going to put it up on our blog and at uh, blog.orats.com. Uh, um, I was out at the the, the FIA SIFMA show, like I mentioned in Dana Point, going to the RMC. Uh, and I'll see you out at the OIC, uh, Mark, in, in, in May. Um, and I, I'm hoping to get down to Puerto Rico uh, and see m uh, my friends again at, at SWAN. So uh, uh, that's what we got cooking at, at, at ORATS, uh, Mark. There you go. Check them out, ORATS.com, O-R-A-T-S.com. Learn more. Follow them on Twitter, at OptionRATS, O-P-T-I-O-N, RATS. Dot com for more info. Maybe I'll see you down at the RMC conference. I will be there. I guarantee you all this fun stuff we're talking about here, about volatility and the VIX and inverse volatility, all that will probably be big talking points at that event. So maybe you want to check that out if you are so inclined. And on behalf of Chris and Matt and our friends over there at OCC who, are, again, are traveling, couldn't join us today, and indeed myself, I want to thank all of you out there in the listening audience for downloading, streaming, subscribing. Of course, all of you who join us live, we love you guys too. And we'll see you next time for more of the advisor's option. You've been listening to The Advisor's Option. The Advisor's Option is brought to you by the Options Industry Council. The OIC was created to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. For more information on how the OIC can help you implement options in your practice, please visit optionseducation.org. The Advisor's Option is also brought to you by Swan Global Investments. Since 1997, Swan has been the leader in hedged equity and option income strategies with GIPS verified results. Swan provides unique and valuable solutions to the inherent weaknesses of asset allocation, offering defined risk strategies that allow upside participation while also protecting advisors and investors against market risk. For more information about our advisor program for separately managed accounts, Swan defined risk mutual funds, or our proprietary option overlay strategies, please contact Randy Swan at swanglobalinvestments.com. Think outside the style box. Think Swan when deciding on risk management solutions to market risk. The advisor's option is also brought to you by Option Research and Technology Services. ORATS is your source for options backtesting. It's where you turn your ideas into results. Founded on the floor of the SIBO over two decades ago, ORATS is a full-service option research firm focused on helping you develop option strategies in line with your investment objectives. With a state-of-the-art backtesting platform, scanning, and implementation tools, ORATS offers end-to-end -end option strategy development making the whole options trading process easier. For information about backtesting, scanning options data, including dividends and earnings, visit ORATS.com or email Matt Amberson at Matt at ORATS.com. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider, or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.